Okay, welcome back from break, everybody. Good to be back with you. Um, we have a good one for you today. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Hatch, who's uh, the CEO of Tech Shop. Uh, and he's got, a, I think, a really engaging uh, set of ideas to share with you. Uh, but to put just a little bit of a frame on it, we've talked a lot throughout the term in open innovation about companies uh, and what they're doing. Uh, one of the things that's worth remembering, uh, and we've heard it a couple of times already during the term, is that users themselves innovate as well. Uh, innovation doesn't stop at the shipping dock when a company ships their product or service off to the customer. Customers are often themselves very creative and innovative in what they do with it. Uh, what Tech Shop uh, is doing is actually putting uh, really impressive, valuable tools directly in the hands of users uh, for a very modest sum of money and giving them the kinds of tools that previously you had to have a lot of capital uh, to be able to get access to, and now they're actually being democratized and put into the hands of just everyday folks. Uh, and some of the things that can result from that uh, are really exciting, and we'll hear about that. We first came across Mark and Tech Shop when we were putting together our conference last November for the Mass Customization Personalization Conference uh, with Professor Frank Piller from Aachen University and from MIT. Uh, and so we learned a little bit about it then and got very excited and are really glad uh, that he was able to come here uh, and join us today. So with that, Mark, let me turn it over to you and Great. welcome to thank our you. class. No, thank you very much. Thank you. All, right. All right, I'm gonna uh, go through kind of three major segments. Uh, we'll start with uh, a little longer discussion about what Tech Shop is on the platform side, just so that you're fully grounded on what it is. I'm gonna talk about the trends and uh, why um, we believe it is an important um, event from a kind of a historical context on why now and why it's important. And then I'll finish with the fun stuff, uh, which is kind of mind blowing. And that's the, the things that people are actually doing when they get access to this uh, platform. Um, and so we'll offer, and please uh, you know, interrupt me as you feel uh, led. There's be a lot of stuff I'll cover, and if I'm going to cover it anyway, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I'll, 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 we'll get to it. If not, I'll try to interact some. And I do, t uh, you know, please tweet. I've got a couple of tweetable moments for you. Um, and uh, LinkedIn, I'm an open LinkedIn guy, or whatever that, you know, whatever that means. Um, so please, uh, I don't do, I actually do LinkedIn for business, so don't Facebook me. I don't do that with people I don't actually know real well. Uh, so Tech Shop is a membership-based, open access, do-it-yourself, machine shop, fabrication studio. We're encouraging writers, for copyright reasons, to call it a makerspace, uh, not a tech shop. Um, membership-based means uh, $100 a month gives you access to the space. We have about 3,000 members across the platform uh, now in the five locations. Open access means anybody who's 18 years or older can come in by themselves, unaccompanied. If you're 16 or older, uh, you can use most of the tools with adult supervision. 12 and older, you can do a few things. Uh, machine Shop and Fabrication Studio is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, uh, save that the design um, parameter that the founder uh, came in with was every tool you need to make anything you want. So it is a big place with lots of tools. Uh, and it's an important um, counterpoint to hackerspaces who tend to have a particular focus. Uh, they tend to be a little bit smaller um, and they don't have quite as uh, many members. Some of them want to grow up into a makerspace, uh, but there's, we believe, some threshold events that happen when you have all the tools that it's very difficult to kind of make that uh, leap. Again, just a more background, 17,000 square feet. That's like six or seven Subway sandwiches front and back, three McDonald's smashed together front and back. Pretty good sized, uh, you know, it's not an aircraft hangar, but it's a full blown, pretty good sized uh, warehouse. We have every tool you need. It's $100 a month. If you give us your credit card and let it ride, it's $100. Um, if you just want to sign up for one month and you don't want to let it run, it's $125. We don't charge an initiation fee, and we can get into that in question and answer. Uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, we believe that you should provide value for money, unlike maybe a local gymnasium who actually doesn't want you to come in. 
Uh, we are a community and we like the community to show up and if you're not showing up, we don't really understand why you would be paying us um, and there are brand issues with that. And we do a ton of corporate events. So we've had you know, all the likely suspects locally, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, Intel, Cisco, et cetera, come through. Um, I encourage you to throw an event there. It's about 100 bucks a head, 100 to 200 dollars a head. We do everything. Our, the favorite one is lasers and beer. It's important to get that sequence correct. First the lasers, <laughs> then the beer. Um, if you're a little more highfalutin, you know, you want to bring a couple professors with you, we do welding and wine. Again, the sequence is important. Uh, and we do sumo robot wrestling and all kinds of other uh, fun stuff. It's actually turned into a pretty important component in our revenue stream. And as the business model guy said, it was a nice little surprise. Uh, there's some, we believe, some huge upside. So what kinds of things do we have? So machine tools. So what you are looking at is a vertical mill. Um, this is the workhorse of the Industrial Revolution. This and the lathe are the tools that basically all the other tools that people use have come out of. What's intriguing, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, is that essentially unless you were a professional uh, and you worked for somebody else, you never had access to this tool outside of the metal shop which most of you probably didn't have in high school. So who had a metal shop in high school? So we got like four. Uh, it used to be five, 10, okay. It used to be requ uh, a uh, standard component in education. It no longer is, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, so this is a lathe. Um, I'll give you a precursor on something I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So we're buying this thing now, uh, $4,700 installed from China. Thank you, Chinese. Um, that is called a digital readout. 15 years ago, that DRO was $100,000 by itself. So that tool went from $125,000, $150,000 to $5,000 in the last 15 years. Uh, this is a computer numerically controlled machine. Um, this machine with the $100,000 software seat used to uh, retail for $250,000 plus. We're getting it for $17,500. And we teach you how to use it in about three class sessions. Uh, and then we have all the other stuff that you need. So these are sheet metal tools, uh, complete welding shop, uh, water jet. And this is kind of our sexy beast. If you're a mechanical engineer, you, you really get excited about this thing. So this thing will cut a four by eight sheet, five inches thick of anything on the planet. How cool is that? And it'll cut it down to one one thousandth of an inch. So it's like near DOD quality. And it uses software that we can teach you how to use in like two or three class sessions. So you can cut um, all kinds of fun stuff. So brick, granite, titanium, cows, birthday parties, pizza. We've cut pizza with it. It works just fine. Um, this is a you know, standard woodworking tool. This one's fun. Safety is obviously an important component in what we do. Uh, we teach upwards of 150 to 200 classes a month um, in San Francisco alone. Safety basic usage is what we call it. We love this machine um, because it's, it has some technology in it that stops the blade within two milliseconds of your finger coming in contact with it. So you actually get to go home with all your fingers. It's an important design constraint. You walk in with 10 digits, you walk out with 10 digits. Uh, it's a $7,000 machine, so it's a little bit more expensive. Um, but you know, trust me, keep walking home with your fingers is a big deal. Uh, complete injection molding uh, system. So we have a, a plastics lab. This is a vacuum form uh, machine. The original uh, GI Joes were prototyped on, on a machine like that. The original bevels for all of your computer screens and so forth are done on a vacuum form uh, machine. This is an injection molding machine, single cavity mold, pr fairly small, but there are a lot of small components that can be manufactured using uh, this methodology. So again, where, when I was doing the biz dev and product development, uh, in order to get a prototype of something like the Square device, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, typically ran me $100,000 between all the engineers, the design time, shipping things back and forth, um, and it would take six months. Uh, now, this can be prototyped for about 100 bucks, and you can do one this afternoon, remarkably enough. Um, Textiles Lab. This was my biggest surprise when um, I uh, got my first tour. Uh, the founder, um, and was like, how in the world did you come up with textiles? I get the machine tools, I get the woodworking. Um, the Plastics Lab, that's, that's a really nice ad. Why textiles? And uh, Jim Newton's the founder, 
and the design idea behind TechShop and Menlo Park was he had 200 new product ideas in his product no notebook. And so what he did was he went through every single one of those and created a spreadsheet and said, what tools do I need to be able to produce this? And somewhere along the line, he needed either sailcloth or a motorcycle seat or some such thing, and so he needed a textiles lab. And sure enough, um, when you need a textiles lab to do a one-off prototype, the last thing you want to have to do is to go find some upholstery shop and get them to do some design for you that they're going to charge you thousands of dollars for because it doesn't fit their norm, they're not designed for it, they're really not equipped to do it. Uh, having it on site and being able to do it yourself is a, um, is a pretty, uh, pretty big deal. Um, we are uh, closely uh, aligned with Autodesk. Uh, Carl Bass is the CEO. His team completely understands this whole DIY maker um, uh, movement. So we have about a $30,000 software load on every single machine in the facility. It's about $600,000 worth of software. One of the cool things that happens when you become a member is you get that disk for free for six months. You can load it up on your computer. This is not the student version. This is the full-blown commercial grade version with a license. You also get three free classes sponsored by Autodesk to learn how to use Inventor so that within the first two or three weeks, you come into our site, you can then go out on these computers, which are pretty wickedly fast. They're uh, HP 600, Z600, six dual cores, 12 gigs of RAM, 24 inch plasma. That's pretty good geek speak. Um, your laptop can't possibly keep up with it. Uh, and then you'll be able to use that to actually produce uh, stuff in CNC. We also have uh, a 3D printer. Um, this is the one we currently have. It's a, a dimension. It's down in Menlo Park. We're getting ready to buy some object machines. and We're putting them in um, actually all five uh, locations. So everybody here knows what a 3D printer is, right? It's exactly what, what it sounds like. It prints things in 3D. I like to mess with kids' minds at the Maker Faire because they come over and they see this thing printing out. And it is like magic. You know, they put a little doll or a little duck and um, particularly if they're like nine or 10 years old, I like to lean over them, to them and tell them that next year it's gonna produce puppies. <laughs> of course, I quickly tell them that that's not true, but you know, after you see something printed right in front of your eyes, telling a nine-year-old it's gonna produce puppies, it's not, a, it's not a big leap, at least in their mind. Uh, the, this is a laser cutter. We like to call this our entryway drug or our gateway drug. Incredibly easy to use, extremely powerful, very addictive all the great things that you would want in a drug. Uh, the introductory class is 50 bucks, and people have launched all kinds of businesses just off learning how to use this tool. Uh, I am desperate to put this tool in the hands of disadvantaged youth and single moms and others through a foundation. We haven't found a way of doing that yet, but this can change people's lives uh, by itself. We have a large project bay. People have done uh, all kinds of cool things. Um, I don't they didn't bring that slide. So my favorite quote, this is what got me back tweeting because um, I signed up really early and didn't really get it. Um, it helps to have a reason. Um, now I've got one. So a guy's walking down the hall and he says, um, wow, I'm really glad to find you guys. It's like, well, why is that? So well, where else am I going to go that I can find a 12-foot wide, you know, 8-foot tall door and all the tools and storage for my lunar lander? <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Where do you go to build your lunar lander? Well, you need a large project bay. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it's a Google X Prize lunar lander. He was doing the hemispheres for the fuel tanks, figured out what kind of baffles needed to be inside of it. And then he's got NASA guys helping out with the gimbals to be able to do. He's, um, he's serious. He's building a lunar lander. Uh, most importantly, and this is uh, where people kind of get distracted by the fancy um, shimmering tools. That's not the magic. Um, the magic is the community. So we have about 900 members in uh, San Francisco, uh, 800 or so in Menlo and, and so forth. Um, hobbyists, entrepreneurs, artists, tinkerers, and students. It spells HEATS. Got any management folks in here? It's, it's, like a, it's easy to remember, H-E-A-T-S. Um, hobbyists we love because they're joiners and they bring all their friends. And these are folks uh, like uh, model train enthusiasts, uh, paper crafting people, quilters, uh, electronic engineering, benders, burners, uh, you name it. They love to join. Um, artists, 
Uh, we love artists because they add some spice and flavor to the community. It's kind of boring having all mechanical engineers in the building. The artists add this great flavor. The other thing that's interesting about artists is they come at the tools orthogonally. You know, an engineer will come in with a design and say, this is what I want to make with this tool. An artist often comes at the tool and says, I wonder what the hell this thing will do. And they often break tools as a result, but they also produce some amazing things that the engineers then incorporate into their product ideas. Um, engineers are, are entrepreneurs. We have three classes of entrepreneurs. We have the serious, kind of hardcore, I'm going to get some angel funding, try to do a VC round, conquer the world engineers or uh, entrepreneurs. We have the uh, design entrepreneurs who are coming in and doing things on spec, you know, like uh, Gap, uh, Levi's, or uh, Mercedes-Benz has asked them to design something, and so they design it. We have others that are designing things that they're hoping then to sell, so they'll do the design and then go into a company and, and try to sell it. And then we have this entirely new class of entrepreneur, um, the eBay Etsy entrepreneur. And has anybody not heard of Etsy? Good. So that is, it's a, that's a really cool platform that enables you, it reduces friction in a marketplace um, so that you're able to produce handmade goods and sell it. It's uh, truly remarkable. And those are the three kind of entrepreneurial classes. Um, and then we have, I call them uh, uh, tinkerers. They do um, kind of random stuff and then students. And it's all students, lifelong learners, adult learners, kids, engineers, uh, you, you name it, any, any kind of... Um, and what's cool is this is one of the most, if not the cre most creative space on the planet. As a result, people bounce off one another, all kinds of ideas. Um, we routinely hear of people's projects being upgraded by others in the community. We occasionally hear of core technology on a commercialized product being upgraded for free by the community because so-and-so's already got a job and doesn't really want to try to negotiate a contract to get one half of 1%, or something. you know, forget it. Have you looked at this polymer? Try this, and instantaneously they upgrade the, uh, the product. That's what happens when you get a community of creative people in an open environment working together and building their dreams. So our tagline is build your dreams here. It's not build your stuff. Uh, and one of the reasons is that when somebody comes into our space, they tend to have uh, kind of blinders on. They're not really, they're kind of focused on their one thing. They also have never been in a community that can provide them these kinds of resources, and they never had access to these kinds of tools. So invariably what happens is whether they want to or not, they come into contact with this space, and their dream actually gets bigger. They literally build their dreams um, there. It's kind of, kind of a cool thing. Uh, so our mission um, in this context is to help drive global innovation by engaging, enabling, and empower people, specifically in the creative class, to build their dreams. So we are a, a transformative experience. Uh, this is a concept that was um, uh, coined by uh, Joe Pine and Dan Gilmore in the book The Experience Economy. Uh, I've been a follower of Joe Pine's and Dan's for 15 or 20 years, actually since his first book, Mass Customization, came out. Um, we are a transformative experience. When you come into the space, you eventually leave in a better place than what you arrived. In his book, he talks about theater, and he talks about um, delivering experiences. And so for our staff, as well as our members, we use language, and we use colors, and we use design styles that have nothing to do with manufacturing and everything to do with delivering a transformative experience. So when you engage my facilities folks, they will be called dream consultants. Um, the staff is called our dream core. And if you're too cool to let yourself be a dream consultant or part of our dream core, then I suggest you go get a job somewhere else. Because your job here is to help other people build their dream. And if you have to humble yourself in order to make that happen, then that's just the cost of being part of this, this amazing system. So the engaging piece is really uh, designed and integrated in. The objective when you come into our facility is to try to engage you and make it interesting and fun. And as a result, if you go into San Francisco, instead of seeing a big wall where it would have been $30,000 cheaper to just leave the wall there, we cut an enormous hole in it and put an enormous glass pain and architected the space so our vertical mills would be right on the other side of that wall. So when you come in, we celebrate these amazingly interesting and archaic tools from the Industrial Revolution. 
we celebrate them. We have some theater around that. You have to badge in and badge out. You don't get to go on the other side of the wall, the velvet rope, unless you've actually badged in. Now, we don't use velvet ropes yet. Uh, enabling means that we provide the platform, and empowering is really what happens <laughs> when you come into the space and engage the community. Uh, now, I'm going to go. I'm going to go a little deeper than I usually do. That's usually I can. You know, by the way, I can deliver this in 10 minutes, um, but I'd rather not. Um, I'm going to go a little more deep, deeply into the Detroit um, location, and the reason is because this was our first kind of serious uh, corporate partner for doing open innovation. Um, Autodesk came in with some funding and has helped uh, a great deal, but Ford actually helped us open a 40,000 square foot open innovation center uh, in Dearborn, or in Allen Park, just outside of Detroit. Um, it's been open just since the latter part of December. I think it was December 27th or 28th that we opened. So we've only been opened a few months. Our grand opening, this is what you do in retail. You open, get the cobwebs out, and then you do your grand opening. The grand opening will be uh, in May. Um, it's coined as the Motor City Innovation Exchange. It was driven by the head of intellectual property and licensing at Ford. So Bill Coughlin is the president of Ford Global Technology. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Ford. It's, it's important to note that he controls a P&L, unlike many of his competitors and other automotive companies where all they are is a cost center. As a result, he's driven that P&L hard and has turned it into, he won't say, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars, more than the nearest competitor is doing 50 to 75 million. He is committed to this idea of open innovation, right? He believes that uh, Bill Joy was right. The smartest people don't happen to work for Ford um, or necessarily anybody in the automotive industry. He's trying to move a culture to embrace this idea that great ideas come from other places. And this is a tangible, physical environment to support that cultural change. It's not just a website. It's not just uh, you know, a bunch of ad copy and some cool inner office memos. It's a physical embodiment of an innovation center. That was, it's an, you know, uh, most people that I know live in real space or in meat space, as uh, I used to like to call it, um, versus online. So this is what it looks like. It was a very odd center. You, know, you kind of was a consumer, uh, uh oh, it's got an automatic feed on it. I don't want that. Um, it's got an um, kind of interesting centerpiece. That's our play. That's our piece. It's about uh, 12 to 13,000 square feet. That's the tenant area where we're going to invite um, General Motors, Chrysler. This is an open innovation center, so it's not just Ford. Um, we're also inviting tier one, two, and three suppliers um, like Delphi and others to take that space over there. Ford is actually going to hold open hours for you to talk to their licensing professional. Um, Bill's crazy uh, in a good way. So I, I've done a lot of innovation and talked to a lot of innovation officers over the years, and I actually talked to some recently. And um, the worst case that I've heard so far is a um, innovation stream that requires from their attorneys that not only are you not allowed to talk to somebody who has a patent, you're not allowed to talk to somebody who has a patent outside of a field that you're already investigating and that we already have a patent picket fence around. Wow, now there is a hurdle. So if something new to the world develops, by definition, it can't get into this company. There is no blue ocean strategy. It's not, it can't happen. That's, that's their bar, and this is a Fortune 50 company. I freaked because needless to say, I'm on the other end of it. Um, you know, launch now, get the customers to give you the feedback and then iterate. And when I say now, I mean like this week. Launch it, now. Um, deal with the patents later. Bill is on the other end of this spectrum. And if you can imagine, this is a Fortune 7 company a company is actually larger than this other one. Bill will not only look at your look at your patent, he will look at your patent application. He will look at your idea before it's turned into an application and help you write the application, pay for it to be patented, and then use his platform to license it to anybody else in the community and bid head to head against General Motors, Chrysler, or Mercedes-Benz on an idea 
that you submitted to Ford over the transom. That is insane. I mean, I, I, um, I had lots of arguments with our patent attorneys when I was at Avery Dennison on how early in the process we, would, we should be able to look at new ideas, and I was stymied at it has to be an issued patent. Patent filed was not good enough. Just imagine, you know, so you, if, you, if, you're, if you're actually doing this well on your patent strategy side, you do submarine patents and you bid build your picket fence and you actually draw that out depending on what it is that you're trying to do, you try to draw that out for a number of years. At least that's one of the strategies. As a result, when you launch five years after you had the initial idea, you then have another five years before you launch your submarine patents and you extend the patent portfolio and patent life by decades. But if you're a Fortune 500 company that refuses to even look at that first patent for the first five years, you haven't got a prayer in this kind of space, particularly against the competitor who's willing to reach back here and help this guy achieve that particular strategy. That is really remarkable. Obviously, I'm a big fan of what Bill Coughlin's doing. Uh, and then this is the combined space. That's a 184-seat auditorium and about a 300-feet, uh, 300 a 300 person uh, area as well. So these are the program areas. This is our entrance. So I'm gonna show you, so I'm gonna show you two things. Um, so part of what's, what I'm describing here is if you can imagine it, you can make it. Make it. And this is a, an example of that. If you can imagine what this is going to look like, you can in fact make it. And I've got this thing on auto and I don't like that. Um, so this is the plan view, the lobby. This is what, it's, this is what it looks like using our software tools. And then this is the, uh, you know, the hub area. This is a computer training room. This is kind of the back end where the machine tools are. And then this is where the auto bay is, along with the turnstile, which is pretty cool, the motorcycle sitting on a thing that actually rotates. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. So again, if you can imagine it, you can now um, build it. And this opened up on the 27th. It's the computer area, machine tools, Tool crib, computer room, machine shop. So what was my point? 17,000 square feet of every tool you need to make anything on the planet. Really. So here are the trends. Here's what's happening. Um, there are, according to Dr. Richard Florida, who wrote a book called Rise of the Creative Class about a decade ago, 40 million uh, people in the creative class. Y'all are squarely in, the, in that creative class. Um, they tend to be engineers, artists, tinkerers, uh, um, architects, uh, um, you know, basically anybody that is creative. So there are folks in this space that don't, you know, don't map perfectly. They include uh, journalists and uh, lawyers and so forth. Um, but it turns out if you have that cognitive capability, you also have enough cognitive capability to use our kinds of tools. So there are 40 million of them. They control half of all the disposable income in the U.S., $474 billion a year. Um, they spend it on McMansions and urban assault vehicles and Frappuccinos. Uh, partially because what else are you going to spend it on, right? And so what we like to... Oh, and according to Clay Shirky... Um, Americans spend, is it 100 billion hours a year watching television, or was it 200 billion? I, I get, I don't know, that many numbers, it probably doesn't matter. Uh, so this class, I would assume, doesn't, uh, doesn't watch television as much, but just assuming 50%, they're probably spending 5 to 10 billion hours a year watching television. So they're sitting on half of the disposable income, the most amazing degrees and in intellectual capital, and they're watching television and buying Frappuccinos. Bummer. So what would happen if you gave them access to these, uh, these kinds of tools? And we'll talk about more of that in a minute. So here's, your tweet. here's the tweet. The largest untapped resource on the planet is the free time, disposable income, and creativity of the creative class. Period. And it's like 138 characters. It is not oil. It is not natural gas. It is not any of that stuff. It is the raw brain power, the creativity that's gotten us to where we are today. And unfortunately, today, the opportunity to pursue passionately amazing creative things that can change the world is incredibly expensive. So I just showed you was like a million dollars worth of tools. 
10 years ago, it was a $5 million tool set. 20 years ago, it was a seven to $10 million tool set. Worse, the software was so hard to use, it would take six months to a year to be able to produce anything worthwhile. So you had to be incredibly dedicated and you had to have access to tools that you've literally never had access to. So let's, you know, so we'll unwind this a little bit. So can you imagine the day when after 40 years at your trade of being a tailor, you realized that you were no longer gonna be competitive. That because of the steam engine and sewing machines, you are no longer going to be able to ply your trade. What would you do? You would become a Luddite. You would become a communist. You would, you would create the Taylor Revolution in 1756, which attempted to overthrow the French government. Why? Because you, wanted, because you believed Marx and you thought that your kids should be raised by the state? I don't think so. Because your livelihood was being threatened by an external threat that you couldn't control? Yeah. So how important is it to be able to make things? We have fought wars over this. Really nasty things for the last 200 years have happened as a result. What's intriguing is Schumpeter, the, the economist, saw into the future and he basically said that's not, we shouldn't be too worried about capitalism because the capitalist job is to make capital as low cost as possible. They're going to compete their way to the bottom. Eventually these tools are going to become cheap. Now I'm paraphrasing him. Well, you know what? He was right. It just took us a long time to get there. These tools are now so cheap and so powerful and so easy to use that we are routinely teaching people to produce highly engineered quality products in three class sessions for under $1,000. So what happens when you take the tools of the Industrial Revolution and you give them to the creative class? I argue that they change the world. And actually, they already have. So, uh, so we're going to have a little fun before I get to this more serious stuff. So this is, uh, this is not Andy. Andy's a little smarter than that. This guy broke one leg and two ribs learning how to fly. Uh, that is not shop bought uh, or, or uh, photoshopped. Uh, that is a pilot flying a jetpack that Andy built. So I ask Andy, you know, why in the world are you working on a jetpack? And good luck with that, by the way. Uh, and he said, you know what, in 1968, he actually quoted it. It was like 1968 cover article of, of uh, Popular Mechanics. I was promised a jetpack. <laughs> and Government Motors, and that's what he said, Government Motors and Boeing isn't working on my, my jetpack. So I am. It's like, how hard could it be? <laughs> uh, so this is a hydrogen peroxide one that gives you a 25-second lift. <laughs> and you don't want to be in the air uh, when you run out. It's a... Uh, it's not the lift off that, that's, uh, that's important. Uh, so he's serious. He is actually building a jetpack now. It turns out, uh, you know, Andy, what's your background? Well, I've sold millions of dollars worth of licensed toys to Hasbro and others in the industry. I'm cur I currently work, my day job is optimizing manufacturing uh, plants around the world. So he'll fly into Singapore and kind of optimize the place. And in the spare time, I'm working on personal transportation because I was promised a jetpack. Uh, I love this one. This is uh, Chris Chalmers. So this is called the Aortic Arch. It's in uh, CCA in San Francisco. It's 3,000 individual panels, each one unique with a serial code on it out of a recycled plastic polymer that looks kind of like, if you were a, um, a doctor, kind of looks like a, the aorta component of a heart. It's very large, like, uh, I don't know, 400 feet apart, something like that. So like any uh, brilliant artist, he uh, won a $5,000 grant and then went out and spec'd how much it was going to cost to build this thing. And it was going to run seven grand. Uh, so, you know, do the math. He was going to lose money. And I guess that's what it means suffering for your art, is that you've run your parents' credit card or your credit card up. He came in, found out about us, used our tools. It cost him 3000 to install it and actually made money. So that was kind of nice. This is the world's fastest electric motorcycle. Did 216 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats last summer. Broke their own record. They did 184 the summer before that. Um, if you're into automobiles, you know, A123 system. So it's, it's the world-class A123 lithium-ion batteries that the Volt uses. 
They built um, all of the components that they couldn't buy off the shelf, the carbon fiber fairing, the frame, literally everything on that bike was manufactured in Menlo Park, and then they assembled it off-site. They planned to become the uh, world's dominant electric superbike company, kind of like Tesla, but for motorcycles. Now, what's cool, um, We've just done uh, a deal with uh, DARPA, which is kind of fun. So when I was in talking with the program officer, I told him this is the perfect assassin's weapon. It's incredibly powerful. It's one of the fastest vehicles on the planet, and it's completely silent. Turns out electric cars, there's, um, all of the torque is available instantaneously. So unlike, you know, if, if you're into popular mechanics or uh, uh, um, automobiles, every time you, go, you change gears, there's a torque curve, a power curve. And every time you change gears, it, you drop. With electricity, you don't have that. It, you have all the, all the power instantaneously, and it degrades by like 3% over the, um, the acceleration range. It's an absolutely phenomenal um, platform and tool. So this is a woman uh, who came in. Uh, Karen was one of our first kind of breakout successes. This is a knitting needle gauge. If you're into knitting, um, evidently the needles come in different uh, widths. By the way, I think this is a weapon. I'm not sure why anybody needs a stick that thick. <laughs> um, so she, uh, she started out uh, actually a year or so before a tech shop came out, and uh, she had this idea. I think that a green bamboo-based knitting needle gauge would have a market, and I want to launch it. So what tools do I need in order to be able to launch that business? You need a $25,000 laser cutter. Dream goes on the shelf, right? At 25 grand, are you willing to risk <laughs> that there are enough people in the US that want a bamboo needle gauge? Well, even somebody in the space said no. So a year later, her husband retires, and she kind of wants to go home and supervise him. Evidently, he was getting in trouble. Calls the uh, laser company back up and asks, you know, hey, is there a trophy shop in town where I could, I don't care if I lose money on the first hundred or thousand units, I just want to see whether or not there's a market for it. By that time, Jim had launched, so she came down and took the $50 introduction to laser class, became a member for $100, bought $100 worth of material, and started building her products. Well, once you see it, it's got all the pretty little lammies on there. You'd want one, too. And so all of her friends wanted them. Uh, and she had a or, you know, complete organic uh, set. So she had the, you know, the free-range goats from the wool and the organic dyes and all that kind of stuff. And it just drove her nuts that every time she opened this thing up, there would be this polymer plastic piece of garbage that she bought at Michael's for 50 cents. So she now sells these for $15 to $20 each. She quit her six-figure-a-year program analyst job. Her brother-in-law quit his job. She now owns multiple laser cutters. And she won't tell me how much she's doing, but I think it's in the $500,000 a year range with about an 85 to 90% gross margin on a business that she cares about and is passionate about. And now she's supervising her husband at home. <laughs> investment was a few hours and a couple hundred bucks because the tools were open access and cheap. Out of curiosity, can I, uh, is there a limitation on the use of a... Yes, we limit it in such a way that you won't go into uh, manufacturing, right? So you can only get so many hours. We try to help you get through the chasm of death, which is, does, is there a market for this? You know, once you prove there's a market, you need to graduate, right? You need to go buy your own tools, or you need to go uh, to a, a shop that will actually produce it for you. I mean, how many hours can I get on a uh, Four at a time, 12 a week, unless there's an opening. And sometimes you can, you know, slip in and out. That's, a, that's enough time to be able to show whether or not there's a, there's a product. I like this one. This one is intriguing to me uh, at a couple different levels. So Danny came in. Um, he was the, uh, uh, pr the captain of the robotics club at uh, uh, Palo Alto High School. Um, wanted a Segway, couldn't afford one. His parents wouldn't buy him one. So naturally, he did what any one of us would do. Go online, find a mentor, and build one yourself. That's a, that's a nice hack, you know, gyros, um, all the mechanical engineering, welding up aluminum tubing, doing all the electronics. Connectors are, are a bitch, if you don't know. Connectors are a remarkable problem. Um, so he built himself a Segway, and then, in my mind, upgraded it. 
He figured, you know what, the problem with the Segway is you can't sit on it. So that is the world's first two-wheeled, self-balancing, 18-mile-an-hour electric bar stool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the world needs. So Andy's, uh, sorry, Danny's uh, got an interesting story. Uh, he got into MIT, uh, but didn't go. Because he figured he could get all the course content he wanted online. He could use our tools to build anything he wanted. And by the time his cohort graduates, he'll be running a company that's worth millions. And I'm actually pretty sure he's on track. It's an interesting choice. He's hooked up with one of the two Thiel fellows that are operating out of our uh, San Jose facility. This is our, one of our long distance uh, members. He lives in Brooklyn, flies out every couple of months to produce these um, custom pop-up uh, books. He's a manja artist by day makes an extra $40,000 a year selling these, uh, these books. Uh, this is Sam. Uh, he's actually an electrical engineer, wanted to learn how to use machines, and so he competed in NASA's Lunar Regolith Challenge. That's a uh, lunar mining uh, robot. Uh, this is Roy, his brother Dan, built a remote-controlled video conference telepresence robot um, that they're using in the Netherlands to deliver palliative care. Um, you see these in places, they're $300,000. This one is five grand. Um, so that's cheap enough to be able to literally just deploy across a city and enable a nurse to be able to go in and check in on, um, on patients. After being on site for two years, he um, sold the company. Again, they won't tell me for how much, but he's on a five-year sabbatical. This is uh, Michael, and um, that is a desktop diamond manufacturing device. Now, I should get a giggle out of that. Desktop diamond manufacturing device. Um, so staff comes in and says, hey, Mark, you got to go meet this guy. And that's happened to me two or three times, and I always drop what I'm doing because we've got a fairly high bar. If the staff's going to come in and say, say you got to go meet this guy, he's doing something interesting. So I go in and I say, hey, uh, I'm Mark. Uh, you know, say, I'm Mike. What are you building, Mike? And he points at this extremely poorly milled block of aluminum. Um, I, you know, in manufacturing speak, it might be a first article. I would hardly have given that a blessing as a first article. It literally had random gouges from where the machine did things that it wasn't supposed to do. What's this, Mike? He says, this is my vacuum chamber for my desktop diamond manufacturing device. I giggled. It's like, hear what? This is my desktop diamond manufacturing device. Okay, how does it work? It's easy. <laughs> okay, at this point, you know he's crazy, right? <laughs> is he crazy in a good way or a bad way? That's what we now have to figure out. Clearly, the boy's crazy. Um, it's easy. Is that right? Okay, well, how does it work? He says, well, first... You pump in 95% hydrogen under like seven atmospheres into this port. It's like, like, it was silent, but when you think of hydrogen, does the Hindenburg come to mind? Um, then you pump 5% methane on this side, and then you pump an energy field in there with a the graphite, and diamonds fall out. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they just fall out. <laughs> Good. And then he goes on. He says, you know what's cool? I have no idea, Mike. This is pretty cool to begin with. What's cool? He says, well, usually the energy devices cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the junkyard and rip the magnetron out of a microwave, and that's going to be my energy device. It's like, so I did some homework. A magnetron runs like 250 bucks. He, this guy wants to grow diamonds, and he's trying to save 200 bucks by using a used energy device. Crazy? Uh, well, then what? He says, well, then you put your graphite in there and, you know, and things fall out. It's like, cool. Well, you know, when are you going to turn this on? This weekend. You're doing that at home, right, Mike? He says, yeah, I'm doing it at home. <laughs> but then he finishes. It's like, you know what the best part is? It's like, I have no idea. You're using used microwave parts to grow diamonds. He says, I put in a viewport so I can watch. Yeah, I'm still not sure, right? Is he brilliant? So, okay, Mike, uh, what's your background? I'm a physicist. I'm sorry that's not good enough for me. Um, this, is, this is crazy. Uh, well, all right, I was the chief technology officer at two diamond tool deposition companies in the last 30 years. I took one of them public, uh, and every couple of years I'd go into the, C into the CEO's office and say, you know, George, 
Um, we're using this technology, but back when we first started, there were two competing technologies. And this one, mathematically, if we can control the variables well, is actually a more efficient and better way of doing it. I think we should be in GEMS. Will you let me do that? And like any good CEO, he said, no, go back to your lab. <laughs> we're a tool company, not a GEM company. But as a result, Mike has been sitting for the last 40 years wondering whether or not this track of science would get us to doorknob-sized diamonds in a $1,000 device. So when you say creative class, and when you say amateur, and you say open innovation, remember Mike, right? Semi-retired, 40 years experience in the field, one of the world's greatest scientists. And when I asked him why here, why now, he said it was simple, Mark. To build this, Five years ago, it would have taken me $100,000. And I'd have to take, tap my IRA, or I'd have to tap friends and family. He says, you know what? I like Christmas. I don't want to give quarterly reports at Christmas. So I golfed, right? I was out golfing. I've been out doing other things. Because at $100,000, I am not going to innovate. At $1,000, I'll try. So a couple others, and then we'll get into the stuff that's actually important. Um, so this was a great one. You guys have seen the Dodo case? Uh, so I'll pass it around. So this is a uh, case. It's got bamboo uh, on the base, and it's just uh, like a moleskin cover, right? So, um, so Patrick comes in. He's got an MIT, right? So he's a pretty bright guy. Um, he's actually an electrical engineer, not a, a mech -E. And what you see down there are uh, routed components that uh, go into that case. So Patrick came in and said, what classes do I need to take to learn how to make an iPad case out of bamboo and book binding? And it was three classes. So you know, run your tally here. It was an $80 introduction to computer numerically controlled machines, introduction to the uh, ShopBot, which is a CNC machine, and, uh, which was another $80, and our textiles class, because our textiles lady happened to know a lot about book binding, which was, I think it was 50 bucks. So he's into, it, he's into us for what, $220, $230. Uh, buy some material. Now, bamboo, it turns out, is pretty expensive. They're like $400 to $800 a sheet. And starts making prototypes. Builds some prototypes, takes some photographs, leverages the community, because he doesn't actually know how to use these machines very well or how to do the design work. Doesn't know how to put the rubber grommets on the side, but there are people in the community that help him figure out what to do with the rubber grommets. And 90 days later, he does a million dollars in sales. From the time he came in and asked, what classes do I need to take, he had a million dollars in sales. He did $3 million in sales in his first year. They did $10 million in sales last year. They're on track to do 20 to 30. You can buy it in Nordstrom's and J. Crew uh, now. And if you look over here, <laughs> wow, you know, what did you do last summer? Um, or better yet, what did I do last summer? All right, now we're going to get into, so uh, one, of the, one of the things I like to say in, uh, to the economic development folks is that if you give the creative class access to the tools industrial revolution for the first time, they will change the world, and I'm going to give you five proof points. So everybody here should know about Square, right? So it's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction play. You run your credit card through here, and it leverages my current bank account, not a merchant banking account. Now, I've applied for and gotten merchant banking accounts in my uh, career, not early in my career. I had to have a balance sheet. I had to have three years of sales. I had to have been using my bank for a long time. If you're an immigrant, if you're doing $50,000 a year, if you're starting up a business, you are not going to get a merchant banking account, period. So that means that you have to take cash or, or uh, checks. Now, what this does is this completely changes the economics of a swap meet. Because now, for free, you can get one of these sent to you, or you can go to Apple Store and for 10 bucks buy it and get a $10 card that you can then run through here and have the money go directly into your account. So for free, you can now get a dongle that goes into your phone. And now, every taxi cab driver, every taco tuck driver, and every person at a swap meet is no longer designing their offering to the cash in your wallet, which is what, 40 bucks? They're now designing it for the money available to you, which is what? 
60 bucks? <laughs> Or a thousand, or two thousand, or five thousand, right? So uh, this is this is James McKelvey. He's Jack Dorsey's partner. Uh, he came in, became a member. These are three prototypes he built in two weeks. That's important. Speed is important. My process, the way I used to do it, it would have taken six months and a hundred thousand dollars. It took them two weeks and a few hundred dollars. They picked up a $10 million Series A, a $50 million Series B, $140 million from Visa, and a $1 billion valuation two months ago. They're doing a billion dollars in transactions a month, most of which are from people who wouldn't have been able to get a merchant banking account. That is transformative. This is Phil. Phil and uh, Bob came in, um, graduated from the wrong schools, uh, had the wrong degrees. They were electrical engineers, worked in the wrong companies, you know, meaning they didn't go here, they didn't work at Intel, and they weren't mechanical engineers. Came up with a uh, liquid-cooled server cabinet idea that was pretty remarkable. Now, remarkable enough that Sun, at the time, still existed, um, donated some servers and they did some work, spent $20,000 of their own money, eventually got a $2.8 million Department of Energy grant to be able to scale it. And the Department of Energy came back to them and said, you know, you guys should have been licensed by now. What's going on? He says, well, it's hard to get traction. You know, the big players aren't that interested in talking to Phil and Bob operating out of tech shop. They've only invested $20,000. So they said, tell you what, we're going to do the world's first global chill-off. And we will invite the world's largest chilling solution companies to compete with you in a head-to-head -head scientifically controlled environment in one of our labs. So they invited Phil and Bob, IBM, Emerson, and everybody else. Phil and Bob beat the next closest competitor, IBM, small company you've probably heard of, by 15%. Emerson was uh, humiliated enough they actually licensed the technology. <laughs> Now, why is this important? It turns out data centers consume 3% of all of the energy in the United States. Globally, it's a $250 billion annual electric spend. 15% on $250 billion? Holy cow. Two boys buy themselves $20,000 basically in a souped up garage because they had access to the tools. This one I like at multiple levels. So Nick came in, this is called Solemn. That is a uh, prototype nitrogen detection device. It figures out how much fertilizer is in the ground already. So that if you're along the Mississippi or actually anywhere and you already have fertilizer in the ground from the previous season, you can run this device over it and it will tell you meter by meter by meter how much nitrogen you need to add in order to feed your soybeans this next cycle. Why is that important? It turns out if you don't fertilize enough, you go bankrupt. If you fertilize too much, you at least get to roll the dice and play again next year. So what do you do? You over-fertilize. I mean, the current methodology is basically you run the calculation. This is what it says I need to do. I know there's a little bit in there. Can't risk that. This is what I need to do. And you carpet bomb the place. And as a result, <laughs> nitrogen rolls into the Mississippi, down to the Mississippi Delta, and we have an 8,500 square mile dead zone where no organic living thing is operating. So what these guys have done is come up with a device that figures out how much is in the ground. So they came in, there were two of them, came with the idea, built a prototype, you gotta love Silicon Valley, raised a couple hundred thousand dollars from some angels, hired a couple more people, moved into an office, did another prototype, raised another couple hundred thousand. Within 12 weeks from the time they walked through the door to the time they picked up $2 million in their Series A, 12 weeks, three prototypes, a $2 million Series A on a groundbreaking idea. Again, that's what happens when you give people access to these kinds of tools. This is the world's cheapest drip irrigation system. And this one has gotten a lot of press. It's called Embrace. Uh, this is Naganon. He's a, uh, graduated from Stanford's uh, D school. And their question was, you know, uh, come up with a product that will help save the world in some way. And so they hit the, the World Health Organization, double click, double click, and eventually they get to uh, infants that are born two weeks too early. Their hypothalamus isn't fully developed, and they uh, die from exposure if they don't get to an incubator within an hour. They can't control their own temperature. So this is a phase-changing polymer-based wax blanket that these guys came up with. It was a brilliant idea. 
Uh, it turns out the design school, like most schools, don't have all the tools that you need and are hard to get on because you know, people are working on their projects. So they became members, came up, used our textiles lab and used our equipment. More importantly, Naganon's hanging out in the community. When a polymer chemist with gray hair wanders over and says, Naganon, what are you doing? So I'm trying to save babies. Well, that's cool. What polymer are you using? Dude, there are better polymers than that. Just gave it to them. Their core technology was upgraded by the community. This is on track to save 100,000 children's lives lives in the next five years. General Electric is their manufacturing and distribution partner. So what happens when you give people access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution for the first time? They change the world. So here are some other things we're doing. We've got to go to, I'm wrapping up and um, I'm doing it really early, so we'll have lots of time to talk. Our go-to-market strategy, uh, we're concentrating, obviously, on where the makers are, high-income education uh, area. We've shifted, and we should probably do that in the conversational thread. Our current strategy is to go after large, leading brands as partners. So we currently have uh, Ford. Uh, General Electric recently announced um, a small partnership with us. We're very close to working with a DIY uh, <laughs> big box. Uh, and we're talking to Berkeley, USC, um, and others. And I just literally just signed a deal with DARPA this afternoon in the whole field's, whole field's um, parking lot. It's kind of cool. Um, we do co-investment and other things. Um, our growth strategy is um, you know, multiple locations. So we're opening D.C. and Pittsburgh uh, with DARPA. We're doing Austin with a big box. We're still working on Brooklyn and L.A. We've added new services. We do a lot more on the event side. We're doing some uh, concierge uh, prototyping, and we're developing uh, more partners. And so what's next? I'll show you a quick, start thinking about your questions. This is a short video clip um, of the Austin uh, oops, location. The other one, huh? This one? There it is. There we go. So this is uh, Round Rock, actually, close to the Dell's corporate headquarters. Uh, again, you see lots of glass because we like to engage people from the outside. This is a um, member project. that We actually got multiple kayaks that people uh, are building. This is a robotic chair that we've actually already uh, built. It's a brand wall. Um, and then off to that side is a DIY. <laughs> I'm going to hide that. That's a, that announcement it doesn't come out until next week. What's cool is we're actually co-branding the space. So when you're inside of the big box, uh, you can see Tech Shop. And they're actually cutting holes in the, in the wind in the, um, their merchandising area so you can see the space on the inside and actually get really you know, engaged. And lots of open space. When you're in a community, you want to see that it's vibrant. Um, so we got a new kind of we're going to do a focused area on uh, robotics because of all the technology partners that are in and around um, Austin. So our open area. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit uh, stuff with jewelry for the first time. So we'll put in a, some jewelry ovens and um, some other kind of cool, cool technologies there. We do free popcorn, free coffee. Uh, food is an important component. I'm afraid. Occasionally, our startups live on the popcorn and the coffee. <laughs> you know, for 100 bucks, like, all they need now is a place to sleep in a shower, and they're good to go. Yeah, skip sleep, right? One of those is optional. <laughs> uh, we're open 9 a.m. to midnight. We kick people out at midnight every night of the week. Uh, we plan to go 24-7, actually. That's something that I learned when I was at Kinko's. It's an important component. It's a... Plastics Lab uh, is in the back. So this is uh, about 16,500 square foot. Uh, it's our, uh, we're calling it our urban model. So our center city model, it, um, we're trying to find partners like General Electric, Ford, and others. For our urban model, we are hoping to leverage somebody else's big balance sheet and access to capital markets because we believe that one of these belongs in every um, 
Lowe's parking lot in the U.S. It may not be a 17,000 square foot version. It may be a 5,000 square foot version. But as I think I've articulated, access to tools is everything. Um, and we think that given the amount of money consumers are spending on buying the schlocky tools that you typically get in a space like this, having access to a shared resource of tools that are better um, is actually a better, uh, better solution. So that's my story. Um, please do LinkedIn me, and we'll go ahead and uh, start uh, answering questions. So I didn't cover business model. There's a bunch of stuff I didn't go into here, but I wanted to drive home kind of the, the core thesis. Um, the reason I jumped sh ship and am doing this is I've got a lot of economic background. I've got a lot of biz dev background. I did the MBA and so forth. I truly believe that this is um, a piece of the future. You know, you've heard that phrase, you know, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. This is clearly a piece of the future. Having access, this is essentially the open source for hardware. Hardware actually costs money. You can't reproduce it for nothing. It takes a million dollars just for the tools. But if you share that and you make it $100, we are now in a new place, a place that humans have never been. And you can see how important it was. 250 years ago, we fought wars over losing access to this stuff. And now we've got access to it. You've got the proof points that show people can change the world. This is a unique place. This is a unique time. If you're, you know, bless you, if you're a mechanical engineer, come on down. I mean, don't go work for Weyerhaeuser or whatever it is else you're thinking. Come on down and start a company. You've got Kickstarter. You've got eBay. You've got Etsy. If you've got any kind of talent at all, you can launch a business next week. I know it because we've seen people do it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, let's take some comments and questions. Thank you. This space is amazing. It makes so much sense um, when you look at it. And I'm wondering, your partnership with, with Lowe's, um, you can see why they'd want to partner with you. It's a perfect match. But at the same time, I could also see them being threatened by uh, people not purchasing tools that they might already use. And is that something you'd yeah, so, so you gotta, yeah, exactly. So you've got to work through that, um, and there are a bunch of issues around the tools, right? So they, in theory, made hundreds of millions of dollars selling schlocky tools to consumers. Um, well, it turns out the margin on those tools isn't that great. You know, unlike materials where you can actually make a lot of money and you turn things quickly in a retail environment, the real objective is to turn. And these things tend to not turn very quickly. They tend to be lower, um, lower margin and... Um, and customer dissatisfaction sources. And if you dig down a little bit deeper, and I'll just keep going until somebody um, raised their hand for another question, it turns out that uh, what the manufacturers have figured out that you only use that tool two or three or four times, and so they actually have to design it for that particular use in order to be able to be competitive. So over time, what they've done is we've, they've continued to reduce the quality of the materials, reduce the quality of the bearings, reduce the uh, accuracy of the tool, and they're now at a place where these tools are not garbage, but they're designed to become garbage after the third or fourth use. And as a result, the consumer doesn't get a real high quality experience with the tool, other, you know, unless they really just enjoy seeing it in their garage. And trust me, um, a lot of people do. I mean, I get it. Uh, you buy your tools. It's a lot of fun. You, get, you know, they look beautiful and so forth. But they're actually not very good. Um, so our positioning um, with the big box retailers is that we think you can make a higher margin on servicing your customer in a way that they will value and enjoy than by having a low margin part of the business stuff lousy product down their throat. And we hit a, we hit a pretty receptive audience. So um, I know you are focusing on the hardware design and producing stuff, but do you have any plan to like being an incubator to like get the you know, uh, logistic support for their um, startup companies in Sayo? Uh, not really, um, for a, a range of, of reasons. Uh, w f you know, for $100, <laughs> you've got an incubator. Um, so, you know, layer, layering services that may or may not be valuable to that person um, is, is it's actually a difficult business, one. Two, uh, it turns out incubating, incubator business is a really hard business. There are very few of them that are good at it. There are very, actually, very, very few of them. Do, do your homework. Read the 
uh, incubators are notoriously lousy um, environments. And there are reasons for that. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to have a huge deal flow. And if you don't have a huge deal flow, you got a small deal flow, and you're not going to get as many good ideas out the back. So I've been in a lot of incubators where, where all I see is failure everywhere I turn, and it turns out to be a really lousy environment to try to be creative and launch something out of. So we are not going to be an incubator. Now, what we will do is, like, startup weekends. We'll do hybrid Y Combinator stuff, but not where we're Y Combinator, um, because we love all of our children. So there's a brand issue as well. If I love this person more than that person, what does it say about what I think about their product? Um, so we, we will invite other incubators in. We will do startup weekends to launch companies. But there are lots of people who are trying to crack the incubation code. We're not really interested in it. Good question, though. Yeah. Are you coaching also about the right, sorry, the right kind of materials to pick and oh, stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So when you come in with an idea... So you, get, so you get 15 minutes of free consulting time with our dream consultants any time you come in. Mm -hmm. And they're available. And they're generally available. That's kind of why we, we hire them. Um, and they will typically point you at somebody else inside the store who will be able to help you with your particular um, idea. Mm -hmm. And then we've got pretty deep relationships with material suppliers all over the Bay Area. And they're more than happy to help you uh, source the appropriate material. Right. I, I just, from my experience of um, trying to mint, fabricate one-off things, yes. um, you paid a lot of money to get a prototype yeah. or to get the real thing made. And I just, I see this as when you did that, you were paying not only for the technology, but also for the knowledge um, that, you know, years of experience making, right. you know, a sign for outdoors that'll last through winter and right. all that kind of stuff. So what do you... How, Our community gives that the, knowledge away. How's the quality away. of the products that uh, yeah, people are Oh, uh, they're fabulous. Creating. I mean, uh, it's, some of it's lousy, right? If you don't ask the right questions, you're going to end up with a lousy product. But some of the stuff is just, is just remarkable. One. Two, um, the community, if you ask, will provide you shortcuts to find the appropriate material. And the tools that we have now include, this is remarkable, um, Inventor from Autodesk has a materials vault in it that includes every known steel and plastic made on the planet. And in the materials vault, you can take your design and run it through uh, you know, an animation that says, okay, this is what the wear looks like, and then you can choose. I want new core steel stainless you know, 135. It will immediately do a 10-year analysis of where the wear is. And you say, you know what, I want to try that in plastic, and I'm going to use DuPont's Polymer X, and it'll drop it in and run it through. So the tools available today are... Um, Actually, I was, in a, I was in a meeting where they launched this tool and a, you know, a master's in mechanical engineering raised his hand and said, I think you should license this. I, I think you should be board certified as a mechanical engineer to be able to use the finite element analysis tool in Autodesk's Inventor. Because it's too easy. Uh, yes, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is that when you first started, you had a business model, and I know that has evolved since you first started. That's yep. one. And the second question is, uh, you, you have been very successful, and I'm sure that you learned uh, uh, through some failures and some mistakes, and uh, what were those? And uh, lastly, the, to follow up on, on her question, if Lowe's were to uh, go with you, eventually Lowe's have to uh, change their business model because they won't make money on the tools because they'll be, you'll be renting them. Uh, they will probably have to change the business model to selling material more so that have a higher margin. So I think the, do you see that also happening? Yeah. So I'll answer the last one first, because otherwise I'll forget. Um, yeah, and when, when uh, Lowe's, like many of these big box retailers, believe that one of their core competitive advantages is their supply chain and their ability to touch manufacturers everywhere um, in the world. As a result, increasing the variability of material in a store is a great thing as long as it sells out the front. So they would love to switch out the tools for... $800 bamboo 4x8 sheets that only take up, you know, half a linear foot um, inside the store. And they're, they're very explicit about that as a, uh, as a strategy. Um, on the business model side, so um, I am really excited about the recent Jobs Act that just got uh, passed, um, in particular the crowdfunding component. Um, and it gets a little technical. Uh, but in the state of California, there is a safe harbor clause that allows you, it's, it's California and Texas only, which is, is kind of driving us crazy, 
Um, there is a safe harbor clause with the state of California, with the SEC. If you follow certain guidelines and you only take money in from um, certified or qualified investors, you can, in fact, advertise to your community and get the qualified investors to raise their hand and say, I'm interested in supporting you. Now, it's not, it's not very well known, and it's not very often used because most ideas aren't as compelling as something like this. Um, many ideas, you know, if you're going to do a pizza shop or something, nobody's going to write you big checks to be able to do that. Um, but we found out early on, that's one of the reasons I jumped, um, that our members are rabid evangelists and users of our space. And so when we opened San Francisco and San Jose, we hit our email list using this SEC safe harbor and said, if you're willing to loan us $25,000, we'll do this for you. And actually, we didn't say that. We said, we're looking to raise money. And you had to click through. You had to show you were a qualified investor. It's like a seven-step process with multiple exits. And I can't show you my business plan. We actually raised money in San Jose without giving anybody a business plan. Two and a half million dollars from the community in twenty-five to $100,000 lots. They had to, all we told them was, we're raising money for San Jose. We then had to qualify them as a qualified investor. We then walk them through what we would pay them, and typically they would say, I'd like your business plan. He says, you know what, we're not going to do business plans, because as soon as I do, I, pro I potentially promise something. It's like, you're going to have to trust us on this. And we got $2.5 million <coughs> that way. That's remarkable. This crowdfunding bill is going to enable us to do that, not us, because we're, we're raising too much money. Um, will enable people that are doing a million dollars or less to essentially follow exactly the same path. It's Kickstarter with equity. So you can launch your business. Again, if you're a Mechie or a business guy, you know, don't get that job at Coca-Cola. Boys and girls, come on over and start something. Um, that'll be true uh, probably by the end of the year. It's now on the president's desk, and the SEC has to uh, give us some rules on what, what hoops you have to jump through in order to, to, to do it. But by the end of the year, you'll be able to crowdfund your business idea. Yeah, I just had a really quick question um, about sort of your go-to market strategy where uh, you're focused mainly on the highly educated income um, areas. Um, and one of the interesting things that we had in one of the other speakers was how um, instead of concentrating on highly educated where their percentage of um, being able to solve a problem or create something is could be high, but then you have a lot of people that don't um, have the education but can solve problems. Um, it's actually a lot larger percentage if you take into account you sum all that. Um, so thinking in terms of your business, uh, you know, the virtualization of this, I could see it being pan out where you could actually offer membership to someone that's not close to a high income or educated area, but then they can potentially use the software and then, you know, have someone create the pieces for them or the prototype. Have you actually looked into that also or is it just for now just focused on we're, fo we're focused on yeah we're fo <laughs> focused on this we thought about it and kicked some ideas around um, we've got a model that we can scale so we're focused on scaling that model I didn't finish this question so um, so that was our original business model raise the money locally um, it turns out you can't do that outside the two states California and Texas uh, there are ways of doing it it's just way slower um, and and it's just not going to happen in real life um, and so we needed to come up with another way of developing these, and our partner strategy is what we're doing now, uh, where Ford paid us to open a shop in uh, Dearborn. DARPA is paying us to open a shop in um, D.C. and Pittsburgh. You know, and why would they pay us? Well, we've got all of the systems, all of the educational components, all of the safety all of the software with RFID, we've got a whole system that we're able to now go into a community and say, you pay us and we'll be glad to set up shop. From a business model perspective, that's a nice move, right? Instead of having debt on your balance sheet, I now have income on my P&L. Um, it's a small change in the business model. It's working out quite nicely, actually. Another question here. Oh, yeah, no, well, first I will say just that it looks great from, also for a, inside like graduate students here might be better off and it might be cheaper coming there than looking for machines around uh, uh, different labs uh, here in an institution. We have a lot, we have a lot of Berkeley, Stanford, and um, uh, San Jose students use, our, use a facility. Yeah. And, and it's funny because when I talk to them, it's like, tell your friends. It's like, why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. 
Uh, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on uh, what uh, these success stories owe to uh, Tech Shop for the actual added value they get by coming there. Yeah, it's, it varies wildly, right? So James McKelvey's, right, the, 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 this one, come on, guys. You, you know, they were going to be successful one way or the other. Um, but doing it in three weeks, there's no other way to get it done in three weeks. And it turned out that the reason they were able to raise as much as they did, according to Jack Dorsey, was that they were able to show a functioning prototype quickly from the time they had the breadboard to the time they raised their $10 million. So it, it's moderately important. And others, like the phase-changing polymer blanket, I, I don't even know if it was fully functional with the polymer they were using. So their, core, their fundamental core technology was donated. And it, you know, your mileage will vary. You will rarely run into a startup in our space that won't say my project was upgraded because I was working in this space. I've actually not heard, I've not heard that once. So you actually sit down and talk with each individual um, uh, user and? Uh, uh, no. Um, we put them out in open space and they hang out and work on their project and then our dream consultants wander around and help people who have questions. So if you're introverted and you don't like talking to people, you can come in and sit down and never talk to anybody and not leverage the community. It can happen. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but if you're moderately extroverted or even if you're introverted and you know you need to be extroverted, it's pretty hard not to get some incremental value. Because the odds are you don't know how to do everything yourself. They're, you're going to run into it. You're not going to know the right material. And you're going to be sitting next to somebody you'll overhear has got you know, a PhD in the material science that you're interested in. And you know, OK, it may be a little hard to say, I overheard that. But it happens all the time. It happens. It's, it's really remarkable. Again, when I went through my slides, what did I say the most important thing was? It was the community. Well, it's not the tools. It's the people that are there. So people are able to protect their ideas? It's not as hard as it sounds. Um, so, uh, you know, w one, um, this has not been tested yet. This is a uh, member-based community, so this is not a public place. So there's a, there, I'm not sure where it sits on a disco disclosure uh, law component. Two, if you actually have a, a technology that can be identified as patentable by merely looking at it, then we will gladly rent you an office for $1,000 a month, and you can go hide in the corner. And we have people that do that. Um, most technologies can't be uh, consumed or understood at a glance. That's, that's the reality. Um, if you've got an integrate design sitting up on a computer and you're working down on one component, there is no way in the world they understand what's going on. And as long as you're clean in what it is that you're doing, you have not disclosed to anybody in that community what that device is about. If you were, then you need to go hide somewhere, and we, we rent offices uh, out for that purpose. Then the next, next piece, um, <laughs> go to market. So um, a lot of people have gone to their deathbed hiding their great product idea because they were afraid some big company was going to steal it. Don't do that. You're never going to get your product out if you're afraid. It's just not going to happen. So file a provisional pat patent as quickly as you can and launch the product. That's, what, you know, that's my bias. File a provisional. It's cheaper. The disclosure requirements are a lot low. You get one year to figure it out. You know, unless you're building an electric motorcycle and you're doing some kind of crazy thing with the anode and the cathode, which most people aren't going to be able to understand walking past the terminal anyway, uh, launch the silly product. Just get it out there. File your provisional, launch the product, get sales. Then go back and do the hard work of actually doing the methods and the claims and da 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 Let me ask a question to the class here. How many of you are working on something where it would really be helpful to be able to build a prototype without having to buy all the tools and uh, all the rest? How many of you are in that situation right now? How many of you would be interested uh, in actually going over for a site visit uh, to Tech Shop in, say, in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay, so we'll follow up uh, on the second of those. Uh, the first of those, you're on your own, but uh, <laughs> you got a resource here, obviously. Uh, but it's, given the level of interest in actually seeing it, we'll, we'll try to set something up. So I'll show you another uh, little, little one. This, I love this one because this, this was a Kickstarter uh, project, so it's kind of hard to see. But, um, so this is a, it's called a C-loop. 
It goes in the bottom of, uh, of a camera where the tripod hole is. And then this is where the straps are supposed to go, right? So a couple guys come in and um, they're just as passionate as I am because it's their thing. And that's one of the cool things when you're working on your dream, you get really passionate about it. And you get a room full of these people and the place just goes uh, asymptotic in no time at all. So he come over and says, Mark, I'm so glad to see you. I just want to tell you about my projects. Like, great, I want to hear about it. What are you making? He says, well, do you know what? And it's like, and, they, and he immediately amped it up. Do you know what the problem is with single lens reflex cameras? It's like, dude, I have no idea. <laughs> So they put the loopholes in the wrong place. You know where you put your straps? They put it at the top. It's like, what idiot designed a camera with the strap holes at the top? It's just like the stupidest place. We're action photographers. Where do we put our hands? Over the top of the strap or under the strap? Well, if you do it under the strap, the strap's like flapping around. It gets in front of your camera. That's the dumbest place you could possibly put it. We've been talking to Nikon and Canon and Fujitsu, and we're trying to convince them that they need to put, you know, it's like going on and on. It's like, dude, okay, get to the product. It says, well, so what we did was we looked at the bottom of the camera and we saw a thread. And so we came up with this idea of a C-loop that you put the strap holders on the bottom. I'm like, okay, so what'd you do? It says, well, you know, we're not mechanical engineers, so we're action photographers. So we took introduction to computer numerically controlled machines, introduction to the CNC um, mill. We built ourselves a prototype. We got the designs done. We got, went off to a shop and had them spec it for us. So we got the prototypes done that looked kind of like this. We got a job shop to bid 1,000 units, and we launched a Kickstarter project. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. So how much money do you need? Well, you know, we only needed like 100 of them made. We needed 75, so we needed like 7,500 bucks. We added, you know, some other 5,000 because you'll always get surprised. If you're doing a Kickstarter project, add that bumper because you will get surprised. And we raised $64,000. <laughs> and they sold 1,000 units. And they got the packaging done and the design done. And so now when they went into Wolf Camera, and said, we got, this, I, this, we got this crazy idea for the bottom of a camera. It's like, instead of waving their hand and showing drawings, they were able to pull out a packaged product that they had professionally produced and say, we've sold a 1,000 of these. It's a completely different conversation. And what was their background? You know, mechanical engineers from MIT? No, these were action photographers. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's a great one. Uh, any th final thoughts or comments? Oh, yeah, I got to have that. <coughs> Just thank you very much for making me so much richer. <laughs> <laughs> How has he made you richer? Just, I mean, access. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a great resource. Uh, I'm thinking about it for my 16-year-old daughter who really is into making things and likes to make jewelry. I'm thinking I've just got a, a new weekend activity with her. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. please do come by. Okay, so next week we'll have Barbara Holzapfel from SAP, kind of the other side of the spectrum in terms of companies and all the rest. Uh, but they, they too are doing some open innovation things, so that'll be next week. So go over to software.